Uh, easily Distracted is the autobiography of Steve Coogan, and Steve Coogan is in his studio in London. Good afternoon, Steve. Good afternoon. Uh, now, it's Easily Distracted, the title comes from a school report. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, um, it just seemed like a very apposite. Uh, I, I was trying to avoid titles that have puns in them, which I think tire quite easily uh, and quite quickly. So um, we, I just found this comment in my school report, which sort of seems to be something that's probably followed me through my life, um, and it seemed appropriate. Mm. So it was primary school, and then you go back to your final school report from secondary school, and uh, it says that... Uh, destined to go far in the entertainment business. So your teacher spotted at that age that you were you had a future. I don't know whether he was being uh, sarcastic. Um, <laughs> right, okay. I mean, maybe he was being truthful. But, um, I mean, the things that made me distracted are the things that I've sort of mined to do what I do, I guess, um, that uh, being, being the, the distractions and daydreaming and uh, going off in my, my own world uh, and not concentrating on the curriculum um, were the things that uh, were, have been grist to my mill. So, uh, the, I, ironically, the, the kind of the, the non-academic uh, activities were, were uh, my route to creativity. Uh, I really loved your book, um, and it's what we're on, love. Like, a lot of it is a love letter to Ireland and to your childhood and to your parents. Yeah, I mean that that the, 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 you know that's very uh, uh, my background, my family, the way I was raised. Was, I had a very you know relatively happy, secure childhood, um, free from trauma. Um, it's not mislit by any stretch <laughs> of the imagination, and uh, Ireland was part of that. That was formative for me. Being aware of my uh, Irish heritage was important to me. Um, it formed uh, my perspective on being British as well. Um, there was always the caveat. There was never a unrelenting, unrelenting flag waving in our house. We weren't, uh, you know, there was always scepticism about the establishment, partly because of the history of the British and their attitude to the Irish. And that, that I was always slightly aware of that. It wasn't, uh, it was, you know, there was sort of um, qualified respect for the Queen mm. uh, because of what she did. But uh, there was, um, there was uh, it, the establishment was always held at arm's length. Uh, and you write beautifully about you know going on holidays to Uncle Johnny's, and uh, one of the most evocative smells is that of a ferry, which includes stale beer, <laughs> cigarettes, urine. <laughs> Lovely. Um, yeah, well, it, yeah, it's uh, it's funny because I was talking. You could they always say that smell is the thing most associated yes, with memory, memory that yeah. triggers me, and uh, even bad smells can trigger happy memories. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, but, but my favourite smell in the whole world is, is definitely the smell of, of turf burning on a fire. And I know apparently they sell turf to like uh, rich, um, rich uh, sort of uh, foolish Americans who pay through the nose to uh, have the smell of turf go up their nose. Um, but it is, uh, yeah, and it's, it's always cut turf. Those briquettes don't smell the same. Uh, the bad news is that um, in 20 or 30 years you won't get that smell anymore because they just announced this week that they're not going to be good in turf anymore. Well, you know, the, the company you do at Borden Amona, that's just a bit of information there on, on the side. I know, well, they'll be changing hands for, uh, I'm sure, like, you know, yeah, 50 quid a brick in 10 years' time. Uh, the other smell was the, the interior of a Morris Minor traveller. <laughs> so much so that yeah, well, you went bought your own. Well, it's again. It's one of those things that, you know, the, the uh, if you're in a, if you're a child of the 70s, you remember when cars had uh, had vinyl seats, um, plastic seats that that you'd just you'd, if you sat on them on a hot day, they'd just bake your thighs and you'd sweat profusely on them, and uh, in the in the winter they'd freeze you. Um, but uh, in the summer they'd always be this. It would always give off this slightly chemical smell. Um, and again, it's sort of it's that sort of waft of nostalgia that uh, accompanies that. And mm. uh, yes, I did it. I bought I bought the, I bought the, the uh, Morris Minor Traveller, identical to the one my mother had in the 1970s, and uh, just so I could uh, sit in it and regress to my childhood. Uh, there's lovely bits of nostalgia in the book, and the matchbox cars and and the matchbox tracks, the yellow ones, and somebody hit you across the leg with it, I think, at one stage. Um, and TV was a big thing because y over and over again you mentioned. Basil Fawlty, and when you saw Fawlty Towers for the first time, you, you said, I want to create a character like him. 
Yeah, that's true. I mean, um, I was you know, te- I was part of the television generation. Um, in the 1970s in England, there were only three channels, and uh, there were two in Ireland, and um, so your what you watched was limited, and there were no video recorders, so if you missed a program, you weren't going to see it again for another couple of years, and uh, I actually became a kind of a human video recorder myself because I just have I had to learn to. Um, but when people would miss a show, they'd say, what was it like? And you couldn't show them. There was no YouTube. There was no way of buying a DVD or anything like that. So you, you had to try and remember the show and try and reproduce it uh, verbally, uh, which is what I do. So it was quite good training for me to, to watch these shows and, uh, and, and try and consign them to my memory. Um, yeah, you say and, in the book that you have a, sort of a photographic memory for voices. I kind of verging on it. I mean, I find, I, I, you know, this is how I got into the business. I used to do the voices for Spitting Image mm. uh, back in the uh, early 90s. And uh, uh, I got that job really because I could do impersonations and I could do them just because I, I'd, I'd listen to, I, I wouldn't particularly study people, but I'd find if I spent time in their company, I could do an impersonation of them just by dint of the fact that their, their mannerisms, I'd, I'd ob- observe them uh, almost unwittingly. Mm. Uh, Basil Fawlty in particular, why did you want to recreate that sort of a character? Um, well, I didn't want to recreate it. I wanted to achieve the same kind of impact that, yeah, yeah, as, yeah, as yeah. a character like that because... Um, just because of the affection and uh, 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 the affection that people had for that kind of comedy, and it seemed to be something that brought a lot of joy to people. And you know, com- you, I can see why co- comedy, um, why people appreciate comedy so much. I kind of, uh, I achieved that really a, a quite a number of years ago. Really, having a character that had that kind of impact. But, but. Um, watching people laugh and the pleasure it brought to people and also how it brought people together because you know people would enjoy comedy programs back in those days and it didn't matter what your background was what your religion was what your politics were even or what your cultural um uh, background was uh, everyone would enjoy a certain kind of comedy and it, it crossed uh, it brought people together and there's something really really positive and uh, and admirable about that and i wanted to to, to uh, be able to achieve that. Uh, and there's a great story in, in the book about your dad was an engineer and um, you, you were the last one in the road to get a, a, a colour TV for some reason, but the, the, the aerial for the TV was up in the attic and sometimes your dad would be up doing some DIY <laughs> and he'd, <laughs> he'd knock it he'd, to one side. <laughs> well, the thing is, because our house was out of a few floors, um, uh, I mean, I had a few flaws, F-L-O-O-R-S, and a few F-L-A-W-S, um, <laughs> which my dad was probably attending to at the time. But, um, it, yeah, I mean, whenever you had to adjust the aerial, you, you'd have to form it. It wasn't on top of the TV, because it was up in the loft. You had to form a sort of human chain <laughs> and uh, and do kind of Chinese whispers, like, move it a bit, move it a bit, move it a bit, pass it down the line, move it, just leave it there, leave it there, leave it there, leave it there, like an echo. <laughs> and by the time he'd got it in the right place, the message hadn't got back, and he'd moved it again. So... Yeah. It would take a good hour to get the optimum position for the aerial to get a, a, a picture that actually was readable. Um, I, he's an amazing man, engineer, as I say. And tell them the one about after he installed um, on his own uh, from scratch the central heating into the house that he was so proud of the the pipe work. Well, he was. Yeah, he was. I mean, the the uh, in those days, people. You know, my my dad did all the work on the house. You know, uh, he installed. He we didn't get workmen in. You know, he'd come home from work as an engineer and then carry on doing engineering in the house. So he installed all the central heating. He replaced the chimney, replaced the slates on the roof, did the the whole uh, plumbing, rewired the whole house. He did it all himself. Um, and uh, I guess sometimes it, there weren't people around to appreciate his handiwork. So I think he wanted to. Um, yeah, he, he talked sort of half jokingly about putting some perspex in the floor so that he could roll <laughs> back the carpet and admire the pipe work. Um, uh, but uh, uh, it, it, I mean, yes, it, it, he he sort of built built the house from the inside out. So, but um, the engineering bug didn't really pass on to me or my brothers. And and there's a recurring sort of theme as well between yourself and your dad that he didn't appreciate what you what you were doing, your career, and the achievements you you achieved over the years. Um, <clears throat> well, I don't think it's, it's it's so much that. I think it's just that um, when you when you you inherit some of the DNA of your parents, but you also in, inherit you, you you also find something else. And how much of it is nature, and how much of it is nurture, is really, you know, is is hard to say. 
Um, but I, uh, I suppose really everyone in the family was concerned about the direction I was going in because I didn't seem to be uh, taking an interest in anything that could translate itself into being a job because uh, all I was interested in was doing funny voices and pretending I was James Bond and, and watching TV and didn't really read much. So I was just sort of uh, easily distracted mm. really mm. from anything that seemed cogent. My, my sort of game, my, my careers master took me to one side and said, you know, uh, because when I was thinking of going to drama school, saying you know, this is a waste of a of a grant of a student grant in the days when you when you got a student grant, he said if you go off and do this, you know, you're going to waste that money and you won't have a job at the end of it. So it's a kind of complete waste of time. Um, so it was a general concern that I was I was just doing something useless um, and you know uh, and do something that, that is kind of not employable. But I, I used to listen to Monty Python records. You know, in those days before videos, you'd listen to, to comedy on vinyl. Um, and I used to listen to that stuff and think to myself, well, these people seem to be making a living out of being funny and goofing around. Why can't I? Uh, and you were still at college in, in, in Manchester when you were getting work as a voiceover artist. And, and then very quickly you became a voice on Spitting Image. So it, it, like at 22, you were driving around in a Mazda MX-5 at BB or Turbo. So you were like, you were going, this is it, I've arrived. Uh, well, I mean, I, I was, I was a bit. I, I had a lot of, in, in my term, in terms, in, in terms of my age, I probably had quite a bit of success quite early. I mean, mm. I've been on the dole six months before, and suddenly I had lots of, you know, disposable income and zero responsibilities. So, I used to drive. You know, I mean, I bought a sports car before I had a washing machine. You know, um, I was, I was that kind of bachelor mentality where my priorities were just like uh, nice clothes, fast car. You know, um, living, living it up, and. Uh, um, yeah, I'm, I used to drive to the laundrette with my washing in the, in, in the passenger seat and just put it in a service wash. And I thought, why would why would you waste money on something as superfluous as a washing machine? Yeah, and and so and then you you spent a bit of time trying to prove to people that I can do I'm, I'm more than just a mimic, you know. Um, so your your career dipped before it came back up again. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I made my name doing spitting image, doing, doing stand-up, and if you do impersonations, you can get a lot of attention quite quickly, because it's pretty impressive. Mm. If you can do a voice, you can you can sort of impress someone in about 30 seconds if you can do it accurately, and people go, wow, you, that, that's that's pretty cool. But then it, you run out of steam quite quickly, too, because it's just like doing a, doing a performing trick. Um, there's no real substance behind it. And so you have to, uh, uh, and I was known for that, but it's very difficult once you're known to tell people you can, do you think you can do something else. And in some ways it's better to be not known for anything. Uh, so it was kind of a handicap being a known quantity. I'd done TV, I'd done Sunday Night at the Palladium, I'd done a few TV shows at the age of 23 or 24, and already I was kind of, people were saying, oh yeah, well, you know, well that, that's, what, that's all he can do, kind of a one-trick pony. So I had to really pull the rabbit out of a hat and, and uh, which is when I started developing character comedy you know, to try and just reinvent myself. Uh, and two men that seem to be instrumental in your career after that are Armando Iannucci and uh, Patrick Marber. Well, that, I mean, I started doing a BBC radio show with Armando in 1992 and that kind of changed my life um, because uh, it was within that programme that uh, Patrick, uh, myself and Armando developed uh, uh, Alan Partridge, uh, which, of course opened the door for me to uh, so many other things and uh, paved the way for my success. Something I'll be eternally grateful for, but it was just very humble beginnings. But um, but Armando and uh, Patrick, Armando Prince especially uh, early on, um, managed to assemble a group of uniquely talented people and we did a very different, we felt we were doing a very different kind of comedy than what had gone before. It felt fresh, it felt uh, yeah, like we'd we'd done, we were doing something that had a, a new spin. Uh, so it was very exciting times because we, when you feel feel you're at the vanguard of a of a new comedy movement, and we felt we were going places. So it was a it was an exciting time, and um, uh, you know, and and really sort of like set the template for the years to come. And I'd say people would be intrigued to you know to read about the birth of <coughs> Alan Partridge. So originally just a sportscaster. That's how, uh, he, and he yes, evolved well, from there. Yeah. 
Yeah, he was just a voice on radio initially who did, you know, uh, sports broadcasts. And then, of course, Patrick one day would say, I, you know, I wonder where this guy lives. What does he do for a living, you know, apart from uh, sports broadcasts? What does he do in his spare time? What kind of car does he drive? What's his wife like? Does he have a girlfriend? What are his kids like? So you start to build the character up. And over the years, he develops. And, and, and in fact, he's had continued to develop for the last 20 years uh, mm. from sort of uh, the sort of fledgling character who was part of a sketch show to getting his own talk show and then a sitcom. And then we did the film. And so I and throughout the years, he's as a character, he's kind of become more three-dimensional and slightly more um, uh, 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 tangible, uh, more real, really, as the years have gone on. Uh, I get a sense in the book that the last five years with Philomena and Alpha Papa bringing you know, uh, Alan Partridge to the big screen have been hugely gratifying for you. Uh, well, great. I mean, the most gratifying is Philomena by a, a long, long chalk. Uh, Alan Partridge... Um, Alpha Papa was great because we didn't uh, ruin it because you, people, some people were sort of suggesting that it, we, we, we might not do it correctly and it would uh, spoil the achievements that had gone that uh, uh, happened previously but I think we, we managed to do justice to the character and a lot of people loved that movie and I was very proud of it um, but I, and I actually made that movie after I'd made Philomena mm. which was quite strange because I already felt I'd sort of I was doing something very different with Philomena, and then I had to go back to doing my day job, if you like, uh, when I did Alan. Um, but both films I was really immensely proud of, but um, m Philomena much more so, because it was it, it was a game-changer for me. And the last time we were talking, it was you were doing promo for Philomena, and uh, you suggested, or I suggested, one of us suggested that it was probably going to be the most successful thing you'd ever done, as it proved to be. Uh, yes, it has. I mean, you know, it did over $150 million worldwide. It was a huge international success. Um, um, Partridge, uh, fantastic success in the UK, but um, it only did a fraction, a, a, a fraction of, of the uh, box office that Philomena did. Um, so, yeah, Philomena was critically and commercially a huge success. And, you know, we got all the way to the Oscars, so it went way beyond... Uh, the success that I thought um, I would have—it was—it uh, was—it was, it was, it was everything I hoped it'd be, and and, a, and an awful lot more. You, you said that you united your audience through laughter, and now you want to do something to unite them through humanity, and that—that that was part of the reason you did Philomena. So, do you think you yes. achieved that? I think so. I think you have to, you know, you, you, if you spend a long time making people laugh, uh, and and it, then it's incredibly gratifying to, to be able to do that, but. Um, to make people think and touch people emotionally and and not just for the sake of it but to make them think about something or say something about humanity is the most rewarding thing of all um, uh, you know the, there is quite a bit of laughter in for mm. me, you know, um, but it's not a comedy. But I, I didn't abandon the laughter. In fact, uh, there's a, the, a lot of the comedy in Philomena is used to sugar the pill of what is a very difficult subject. And um, I was proud that I was able to broach that subject, um, not in a didactic or lecturing kind of way, but in a way that had uh, tenderness and humanity and wasn't uh, um, confrontational. You know, um, I think a lot of people when I was writing it were concerned about that, but, you know, we took it to the Vatican and uh, the Pope's uh, 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 officials, his, uh, um, you know, his uh, private secretary and uh, um, one of his cardinals watched the film and said they, they were very comfortable with this film and thought it was, um, you know, they were much more open and uh, conciliatory and welcoming uh, than uh, some of the d detractors in America and some of the det detractors in Ireland, has to be said. Uh, isn't Philomena Lee just an amazing woman? She's great, and she's actually been a real ambassador for some of the issues raised in the film. Yeah. Uh, I know she's continued to visit Ireland and, and to talk on the subject. Um, if in a way the the end of her story is the film, uh, because it sort of completed the healing process for her, because she saw that people something that she was ashamed of for 50 years, a secret that she carried, um, with a certain amount of embarrassment, and uh, it was something that she'd overcome and turned into a strength um, so and I was happy to be to have played a part in that Back to where we started in Ireland and um, you talk about panic attacks in Edinburgh after taking cocaine and you went to a therapist and the therapist said to you think about something that you know brings you joy makes you happy and what did you think of? 
Um, well, it's funny when you have panic attacks, which are, can be quite. De I mean, they're, they're, when they happen at the time, they they feel utterly catastrophic. You feel like you're having a heart attack, and of course, anyone tries to convince you that you're you're not. You think that they're mad, and you think you're dying, and it can be really debilitating. And then you think you're going mad, and it's only when I got some therapy. But part of the process was to try and think of a calming something that would calm you, a vista. And uh, I'd, I'd think of uh, I'd think of one in. Uh, in Mayo, a view that I had from the cottage, the farmhouse I used to go and stay at as a child, where I would look out over the lakes, over the bog, um, towards Crow Patrick, and um, and that would uh, that was the thing I would fixate on to stop me getting these panic attacks. And um, it's a very serene view, and something I still think about uh, to this day. So I was very pleased about that. You're celebrating your 50th birthday next week. Is that a big thing yes. in your life? Well, uh, yeah, I, it's you know, I, I it, it seems odd to me, but um, I, I'm having a big celebration. Uh, it, it's it's a milestone in anyone's life, I guess, um, and I uh, I suppose it it feels very grown up. In my forties, I think I could I could sort of still pretend somehow it's just like a a kid, but fifty feels like um, it feels it feels scarily grown up. Yeah, are you grappling with your mortality? Um, I, yeah, I suppose, I, I, you know, it's funny, I probably was more anxious about turning 30. I'm kind of, when you get to this age, you're just kind of much more uh, um, carpe diem about things. You just, <laughs> uh, you just roll with the punches. I'm, I'm, I'm probably happier now than I was when I was 30. Okay. Listen, because it's your 50 and because you have an autobiography, we just put together a couple of clips that sort of span your... Um, your career. So we've one from Alpha Papa, you do Neil Kinnock and Spitting Image, you as Tony Farino on Clive Anderson. Then we're back to Alan Partridge, that scene where he's talking to Graham Lynn and Arthur Matthews about Sunday Bloody Sunday. And then, <laughs> and then there's a bit of the trip at Rob <clears throat> Ryden and we finish off with Philomena. So uh, happy birthday, Steve Coogan. Have a listen to this. Aha! So you Finney. Tony and me, pretty puffed up, like a, an owl. Well, let's hope you're a wise one. Nice. I pitched it up, you knocked it out of the park. Synergy. Well, no, that's lesbians. Let's get out there and prepare for a Labour government. <laughs> a Labour what? You know, a Labour government. Um, what do you mean? Come on, you remember Harold Wilson, Jim Callaghan, Labour leaders at number... Number... Number 10. Uh, number 10. It's um, Portugal, my fan club numbers 20 million people. <laughs> Can't be more than about 10 million people living in Portugal. That's right, it's twice the population, yes. They love me so much, they join the fan club and then there's nothing else to do but uh, join again. A Sunday, bloody Sunday. What a great. It really encapsulates the frustration of a Sunday, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> you, you wake up in the morning, you, you, you've got to read all the Sunday papers, the kids are running around, you've got to mow the lawn, wash the car, and you think, Sunday, bloody Sunday. I was wondering whether you'd actually booked the mini <laughs> in Italy. It's not a job just to give you the opportunity to say, you're only supposed to blow the bloody doors off. Uh, but I've done it now, so... I shook hands with him. Well, well what kind of a handshake did he have? I, well, it, it was firm. firm. I mean, I would remember if he'd had a weak handshake, that he'd go to that position with a, with a weak handshake. No, so he had a firm handshake. What else? He was smart. Oh, I always kept him smart. <laughs> and did you remember anything he said? Hello. Hello. Oh, Martin. Oh, Martin. Uh, easily Distracted um, is Steve Coogan's autobiography. It's been a real pleasure talking to you, Steve, and happy birthday again. Thank you very much indeed.